Stories from the pages of time. Stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement as we go in search of history. In the early 1960s, the world watched as the Mercury 7, America's first astronauts, led the United States into space. What the world didn't know was that 13 American women had also qualified to become astronauts, but none of them ever got a chance to fly in space. They had the right stuff, but the wrong sex. Join us as we travel in search of history and unveil the story of the Mercury 13 Secret Astronauts. On February 2nd, 1995, Space Shuttle Discovery sat poised for liftoff on Pad 39B at Florida's Kennedy Space Center. Mission Control passed the word. All systems were go. Mission STS-63 looked to be another routine shuttle flight. But there was something very special about this mission. For the first time, the pilot's seat was to be occupied by a woman, a former test pilot named Eileen Collins. The 39-year-old Air Force Lieutenant Colonel from Elmira, New York, would become, in a few moments, the first woman astronaut to pilot an American spacecraft. But then, for technical reasons, NASA had to postpone the shuttle launch by 24 hours. For Eileen Collins and her fellow crew members, it was a frustrating delay. But in the history of women in aviation, it was just a minor setback in a long and difficult journey. Four, three, two, one, and we have liftoff. The spectacular liftoff of Discovery with Eileen Collins at the controls fulfilled the long-delayed promise of equality for women pilots. It's a quest that began long before there was a space shuttle, long before there was even a space program. The dream of equal rights and equal flights for women aviators is as old as aviation itself. In 1910, a journalist from New York named Harriet Quimby refused to take no for an answer and finally convinced a male flight instructor to teach her to fly. After a few short lessons, Quimby became the first woman to earn a pilot's license in the United States. Harry Quimby used to dress in a plum-colored velvet flying suit. She had a big sort of hood that she would put over her head. And I mean, people just loved it. Just ate it up with a spoon. Quimby took her flying seriously. In April 1912, she became the first woman to fly across the English Channel. An event which would have gotten her a lot more acclaim had it not been the fact that the Titanic sank the night after her flight. And unfortunately, the newspaper headlines did not read, Harriet flies the Channel, but Titanic sinks. Three months later, on her way to an air show, Quimby tumbled from the open cockpit of her plane and was killed. But risks didn't stop women from pursuing their dreams. During the 1920s, female pilots were still regarded as novelties. They were called flying flappers and petticoat pilots. The organization that verified speed and altitude records, the International Aeronautical Federation, listed the achievements of women as merely miscellaneous air performances. But the women were more than death-defying attractions at air shows. They were, in essence, test pilots. A lot of the air racing and the altitude records were doing more than just winning awards for their pilots. They also proved what aircraft could do. 
How high could a certain aircraft go? How long could it travel? And that's very, very important. In 1929, the Federation finally changed its policy and officially recognized the record-breaking flights of women. On August 14th of that year, 20 female pilots gathered in Santa Monica, California for the first annual Women's Air Derby. It was a grueling eight-day race from California to Cleveland, Ohio, that the press dubbed the Powder Puff Derby. 23-year-old Louise Thaden finished first. The Powder Puff Derby did more than showcase the skills of women pilots. It gave women pilots the opportunity to meet one another, many for the first time. Building on their newfound camaraderie, they decided to create an association of female pilots. Since 99 of the 126 licensed female pilots pledged their support, the group named itself the 99s. They elected 32-year-old Amelia Earhart as their first president. Earhart had gained a great deal of notoriety with her transatlantic flight in 1928 and used her newfound fame to encourage women to fly. I think her essential message was, um, if you're a woman, don't let obstacles stand in the way. Don't take obstacles for granted. If you want something, if you have a goal, go do it. An ambitious entrepreneur from Florida named Jacqueline Cochran heeded Earhart's advice. In the early 1930s, Cochran worked as a beautician and sold cosmetics. Rather than waste time driving to her customers, she figured that flying would be more efficient. In 1932, Cochran took some flying lessons. Something stuck. It's like a Roman candle went off in her brain. And she said, yes, that's what I'm going to do. And when Amelia Earhart disappeared, Jackie Cochran was right there to step into her shoes. It wasn't long before Cochran was breaking speed and distance records. In 1938, she won the prestigious Bendix Air Race by flying from Burbank, California to Cleveland in eight hours and 10 minutes. In 1940, she set a new world speed record of 332 miles per hour, faster than any woman or man had ever flown. When America entered World War II after the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, Jackie Cochran saw an opportunity for women to help with the war effort. She convinced General Hap Arnold, the commanding general of the Army Air Forces, that women pilots could be used to fly newly built warplanes from the factories to the airfields. General Arnold liked the idea and in 1943 created the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, or WASP. He appointed Jackie Cochran as one of the directors of the program. 25,000 women applied for only 1,000 positions. After flight training, they received their wings and joined the new flying unit. With women flying behind the lines, male pilots were freed for combat duty a new era had begun. For the first time, American women were flying military aircraft. Women pilots risked their lives right alongside the men. During the war, 38 wasps died in accidents. Decades later, however, investigations revealed a frightening fact. Some of the women had died as a result of sabotage but who tampered with their planes remains uncertain. By the fall of 1944, unemployed male pilots protested that the women had taken their jobs and the WASP program was disbanded. At the end of the war, people said it is on the record that women can fly. But immediately, the question changed from could they, can they, to should they. 
That's a sociological question. That reflects our society's values. And the answer in 1945 was no, they should not. But social stereotypes didn't deter Jackie Cochran. After the war, she continued to prove women pilots could do just as well as men. In 1953, she flew a jet fighter 653 miles per hour, becoming the first woman to break the sound barrier and the fastest woman alive. During the 1950s, the United States and the Soviet Union were fighting a Cold War. The intense rivalry between democracy and communism prompted an arms race and a space race. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite. On October 4, 1957, the Soviets put the first man-made object into space. It was a small satellite, but Sputnik's beeping sounded defeat for the United States. American engineers were now playing catch-up to the Russians. A year later, the United States launched its own satellite. In 1959, the newly formed National Aeronautics and Space Administration announced an ambitious plan. Project Mercury. The goal was to put the first man in space. Jackie Cochran had a plan too. A plan that included women in the game to beat the Russians. Project Mercury was America's first manned space program. In 1959, as engineers assembled a rocket, NASA was looking for some pilots willing to fly it. From a list of the military's top jet pilots, NASA picked 32 men to take a battery of special exams at the Loveless Clinic in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The Loveless Clinic had a worldwide reputation as a leader in aerospace medicine, thanks primarily to its director, Dr. Randy Loveless. Randy was a person of great magnetism, very forceful personality. Randy also had an ability to see into the future that was unique, and uh, he could imagine things that other people thought were preposterous, and he could imagine ways of getting these things done. Randy Loveless first brought together his passion for medicine and aviation back in the 1940s during a stint as an Army flight surgeon in World War II. Loveless invented a number of important devices that made high-altitude flights safer and more reliable. After the war, Loveless returned to his clinic in Albuquerque. When NASA needed a doctor to screen astronaut candidates, it turned to Randy Loveless. In February 1959, Loveless began his examination of the 32 most qualified military pilots. We thought we knew quite a bit about human beings, but we'd never seen human beings like this. They were extraordinary intellectually. They were extraordinary emotionally. They were extraordinary physically. The doctors designed tests to learn how a person would react to the stresses of spaceflight. Exams that would measure the strengths and weaknesses of the human body. Some tests were very complicated and others seemed almost absurd. The most basic test for stress is to have a person stick their hands in a bucket of ice water and ask them to hold it there. It will induce stress faster than anything else. 
and the purpose of the test was to discover how long could you stand it. The doctors measured bodily functions in every extreme. The candidates were pushed to the limits of their endurance and then pushed again. In a grand ceremony on April 2nd, 1959, NASA introduced seven pilots, the best of the best, who would lead the United States into space. Known as the Mercury Seven, the star travelers became America's newest heroes. In September 1959, Loveless attended an international medical conference in Moscow. At the meeting, Loveless heard some incredible news. The Russians were considering putting a woman in space. Back at home, Loveless and his colleagues discussed the idea of putting a woman through the same tests they had given the Mercury 7. They weren't thinking a woman astronaut. They're just curious to compare the experiences, the differences, the similarities between men and women. At an Air Force gathering in Miami, Florida, Randy Loveless had the good fortune to meet a talented 28-year-old pilot from Oklahoma named Jerry Cobb. Next to Jackie Cochran, Jerry Cobb was the most accomplished female pilot in the United States. Boy, isn't that a honey? Say, she is a honey. But meet Miss Jerry Cobb, who's just flown in here to Tyndall Air Force Base to be with us here at Operation William Tell. Jerry, it's nice to have you here. Thank you, Colonel Brady. Jerry Cobb had been flying since she was 12 years old. She had set a world speed record in her twin-engine Aero Commander. As a tribute to her flying prowess, the Air Force offered her a flight in a jet. She piloted the Delta Dagger faster than the speed of song. Jerry Cobb seemed the perfect candidate for the tests that Dr. Loveless had in mind. And he asked Cobb, are you up for it? Are you game? How would you like to take these tests? Cobb said, absolutely, I'm up for it. Cobb reported to the Albuquerque Research Lab on February 15, 1960. For a week, she endured 75 different tests. Cobb had done well on the exams. In some cases, she did better than the men. But Cobb couldn't tell anyone about it. Loveless had sworn her to secrecy. He feared that premature discussion might make the whole affair come off like a publicity stunt. Then, six months after the tests, Loveless went public. At a medical conference, Loveless detailed his findings. He concluded that Jerry Cobb was ready for space. Jerry Cobb became an instant celebrity. The shy pilot did her best at handling the media avalanche and the embarrassing stereotypes. Do you think you can compete uh, with men? I'm not competing with the men at all. I think that both men and women will be flying in space. Well, a pretty girl like you must have thought uh, something about marriage. What about that? <laughs> no. Um, more interested in this right now than anything else in the world. Uh, you mean that you're uh, a little bit more afraid of uh, men than you are of space? <laughs> no, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. In September 1960, Cobb moved on to a second, more complicated phase of testing. Again, her performance exceeded the doctor's expectations. It shocked them in some ways. Again, not because they were afraid of a woman beating on a man, but it, their assumptions seemed to be false. And like good scientists, they said, do you suppose this is true for all women or that we just have an anomaly? To substantiate his conclusions, Loveless needed to test more women. For help, he turned to an old friend, Jackie Cochran. The two had met during the Second World War 
and built a lasting friendship. Cochran had always been a strong and vocal advocate for the equality of women. Jerry Cobb, the young pilot from Oklahoma, had passed with flying colors the same tests given the Mercury 7. Dr. Randy Loveless, the man behind the tests, thought Jerry Cobb was an exemplary candidate. She had the same unique blend of physical toughness and technical skill demanded from the male astronauts. But Loveless felt that more than just one woman should be tested if scientists were to get a complete picture of how women would react to spaceflight. At 55, Jackie Cochran, the famous aviator, was too old to be considered for the astronaut program. But Cochran convinced Loveless that she could find plenty of qualified women willing to take the tests. Cochran even volunteered to pay for the additional tests herself. This isn't a question of NASA wanting to do anything. This was Randy Lovelace wanting to do this. And Jackie Cochran, his good friend, agreed to help him out. She said, sure, I'll pay for some tests. Jackie Cochran and Jerry Cobb searched the flight records kept by the FAA and the 99s, the Association of Female Pilots. They were looking for women under 40 years of age who had a commercial pilot's license and a minimum of 1,500 hours flying time. Irene Leverton had been flying airplanes since 1944. She made a name for herself as a skilled air racer at a time when men dominated the circuit. She proved herself a capable pilot in all sorts of aircraft, from crop dusters to twin-engine air ambulances. She was 34 when Loveless invited her to the clinic. It was a phone call late in the evening, and it says, I'm Mr. So-and-so, and he said, this program is going on. Are you interested in taking these tests? And I said, sure. And uh, he didn't promise anything or do anything, and they indicated they were the same tests the Mercury astronauts had taken, you know, and I perked up. <laughs> and I thought, we can prove ourselves one more time. Leverton gladly accepted the invitation, and in the spring of 1961, she left her job as a flight instructor and went to Albuquerque. 23-year-old Janora Jessen was teaching flying classes at the University of Oklahoma in 1961. She had heard about the astronaut tests from a friend. And I thought, well, gee, that sounded interesting. I'd like to, to participate in that. So I wrote Dr. Lovis a letter, and I said, uh, the way I understand the qualifications, I just really don't see any way how you could have these tests without me, and, and you know, please let me in. So um, I got a letter right back from him, and he said, uh, fine, come on. Throughout the spring and summer of 1961, 20 women took the astronaut tests at Loveless Clinic. They endured the same difficult exams given men like Alan Shepard and John Glenn. Kay Cagle, a 35-year-old pilot from Macon, Georgia, remembers her reaction to a vertigo test. I lost my cookies, so I'm leaning over gagging away, you know, and uh, I turn to Dr. Lovelace and say, uh, I don't get air sick. And uh, he said, he just got his eye I was about this close to my face, and he says, if you hadn't got sick, you wouldn't pass these tests. The other thing that was striking about the women is that they were more pliable than the men. They didn't gripe as much. When they were told they had to be in bed at 7 o'clock, they went to bed at 7 o'clock, and when they were told they had to take an enema before going to bed and take an enema when they woke up, they did it. And they didn't protest and they didn't give any reasons why they shouldn't do it. So they didn't complain as much. I think women are more tolerant of pain than, and discomfort than men anyhow. By the summer of 1961, 12 women had passed the clinical tests. They returned home with instructions to stand by for the next phase of exams. Meanwhile, 
Loveless had sent Cobb for a final battery of tests at the Pensacola Naval Air Station in Florida. During the airborne electroencephalogram, Cobb rode in a Navy fighter jet with 18 needles wired to her head as the pilot performed aerobatic maneuvers to measure her reaction to the shifting force of gravity. Again, Jerry Cobb made the grade. Then her path to space took an unexpected leap forward. The Russians surprised the world when they put a man into space on April 12, 1961. With the 108-minute orbit of Yuri Gagarin, the Soviets had beaten and humiliated the United States once again. A month after Yuri Gagarin's orbit around the Earth, Alan Shepard, atop a Mercury Redstone rocket, became the first American in space. However, since Alan Shepard's 15-minute flight was suborbital, the U.S. space program still lagged behind the Russians. Jerry Cobb announced that the United States had a perfect opportunity to beat the Russians. An American woman could be the first woman in space, and she could be that woman. By the summer of 1961, 13 women had proved themselves fit for space. Jerry Cobb and 12 other female pilots had passed the arduous physical exams that qualified them to continue astronaut testing. The Russians had twice beaten the Americans into space with the launch of the first satellite and the flight of Yuri Gagarin. America's 13 female astronaut candidates were ready to recapture the momentum for the United States. Only one step remained. The women needed experience in flying a jet. At Dr. Lovelace's request, the Pensacola Naval Air Station in Florida agreed to give the women special jet orientation training. Jackie Cochran, once again, was paying the transportation and the expenses down there, and uh, so my airline ticket had been purchased and uh, I was ready to go. But two days before the tests were to begin, Dr. Loveless called Jerry Cobb. Bad news. The tests were canceled. The Navy had withdrawn its support. Cobb was devastated, but undaunted. She and some of the other women worked to revive the program. They beat the drums in the media, on the lecture circuit, and even on Capitol Hill. It turns out that Jane Hart, one of the 13 astronaut trainees, was married to Michigan Senator Philip Hart. Hart had the clout to convince Congress to hold hearings on whether or not the astronaut selection process discriminated against women. On July 17, 1962, Jerry Cobb, with Jane Hart at her side, faced an open hearing of a House Special Subcommittee of the Committee on Science and Astronautics. We who aspire to be women astronauts, declared Cobb, ask for the opportunity to bring glory to our nation by an American woman becoming first in all the world to make a space flight. Cobb further explained that the women were blocked from becoming astronauts not by the physical and educational requirements, but by NASA's condition that all potential astronauts have jet test pilot training. Cobb suggested that what should count is flawless judgment, fast reaction, and the ability to transmit that to the proper control of an aircraft. Ms. Cobb, do you think women are being discriminated against in the space program? I don't think necessarily they're being discriminated against. I think that the rules have been established 
to where it makes, in, it makes it impossible for women to meet the qualifications of astronauts. I think this is only the only discrimination and that these qualifications should be accepted for women having uh, equivalent experience instead of having to meet the same qualifications as the male astronauts did. The NASA representatives disagreed. NASA Administrator James Webb brought out the big guns. Scott Carpenter and John Glenn had just been in space. They were America's greatest heroes, and their opinions carried enormous influence. Glenn testified that civilian flying is not the same as being a jet test pilot. He also pointed out that women were fighting more than regulations. The fact, Glenn stated, that women are not in this field is a fact of our social order. Ms. Cobb, you argue today that women would make better astronauts in some respects than men. Do you really believe this is true? Uh, this has been proved by doctors and scientists in certain areas. Of course, it's very obvious that women weigh less and require less food and oxygen. So in some areas, women would be better, in other areas, men. I don't think one outweighs the other. Both equally would make good astronauts. Perhaps the most pivotal moment in the hearings came with the testimony of Jackie Cochran. Cochran was traveling in Europe at the time and submitted her statements in writing. And she wrote letters that said this, I believe this is a wonderful program. I am as eager as the next to go into space. Yet I know that that's not in the national interest that you can't have a separate test program going on right now. You can't have a separate training program. You can't teach these women to be jet test pilots and get a program going. You put the whole space program back, and that's silly. We're trying to beat the Soviets, not slow down the American program. The women were stunned. Jackie Cochran had funded the tests in the first place. People thought, this is the woman who led the WASPs during World War II. How could she testify against this? That was extremely powerful testimony. You can't deny the power of that. And it didn't matter that Janie Hart had the clout to get a hearing. Jackie Cochran had the clout to end the ambitions of the women in this program. Jackie Cochran did not abandon the ladies. She just knew and she was licked. And she was up against the bureaucratic walls in Washington and she understood without any question that this was not the time and this was not the place and it was gonna have to be relegated to the future. And she accepted that. It wasn't that people intended to discriminate against women. They never thought about it in the first place. It hadn't occurred to them to test women. But when it was presented, it was extremely inconvenient. It was a bad time. The Washington bureaucracy had kept the status quo. And the 13 women had lost their chance to become astronauts. It was just, uh, you know, it was just one of those things, that's the way things are. I was terribly disappointed. I was, uh, you know, I had my hopes up that I was gonna get riding that thing. I didn't really understand what uh, what had caused the cancellation so uh, you know I really couldn't lay any blame and uh, then as time went on it was obviously dead and uh, so there was nothing further to do. Cobb didn't give up. She inundated the NASA director with letters explaining why the program should continue. Her pleas even reached the White House but to no avail. For Cobb and the other women, the race to space was over. A year after they ended their would-be astronaut careers in disappointment, a woman finally did fly in space. But she wasn't an American, and she wasn't even a pilot. On June 16, 1963, the Russians beat the United States again. A Soviet cosmonaut named Valentina Tereshkova became the first woman in space. The 26-year-old Russian wasn't even a pilot. 
she was a textile factory worker. Tereshkova spent three days in space, at that point more time than all six American Mercury flights combined. It would take another 20 years before an American woman would travel in space. Two decades later, the United States finally matched the Russians. On June 18, 1983, Dr. Sally Ride, a mission specialist flying aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger, became the first American woman to fly in space. In October 1984, Kathy Sullivan became the first American woman to walk in space. She too was a mission specialist. To date, 28 American female astronauts have flown on the shuttle. I do remember thinking, this is my first flight, you know, please don't let me screw up. But I remember that launch time went very quickly. The external tank is jettisoned, what do we do now, where are the computers, um, you know, when do I get out of my seat? I've flown on the space shuttle four times. The first time is very exciting because you don't quite know what to expect. You go from being excited about being there to being focused on your timeline and then maybe being very hesitant to go to sleep because that's really where your free time is and wanting to stay up late and, and take in the beautiful view of our planet. Seeing this lone orb suspended in the darkness from the vantage point of orbit is almost surreal. Women astronauts share the thrills as well as the risks of spaceflight. Two of the seven crew members who died in the Challenger disaster in 1986 were women. In 1996, Shannon Lucid broke the record for the longest time spent in space aboard the Russian space station Mir. The requirements to be a pilot in the space program remain the same as they were when the Mercury 7 were selected back in 1959. All of the pilots for the shuttle must be military and they must be jet test pilots. If you want to drive the space shuttle, if you want to be at the top of the rocket, you have to have had jet flying experience, and again, as a test pilot. Today, unlike 1959, women can be military test pilots and have then the chance of becoming a space pilot. I don't know if I ever wondered if I had the right stuff or not. I've wanted to be an astronaut uh, ever since I was 11, and I think that because I was given the permission from my parents to say that I could do anything I wanted to do and that there were no limits. I really didn't worry too much about it and so everything just sort of progressed. I mean, obviously the timing was right for me. Uh, it, it might not have been, but it, it was. The pioneering pair who started women on their journey into space never lived to see it come to pass. Jackie Cochran, the famed aviator and record setter, died in 1980. Randy Loveless, the daring doctor that started the whole program, perished in a private plane crash in 1965. Some of the original 13 women astronaut candidates still live the dream that got them thinking above the clouds. After the congressional hearings in 1962, Jerry Cobb went to Brazil, where to this day, she flies medicine and food to the people of the Amazon. Now 75, Kay Cagle is a retired aircraft mechanic, but still finds a way to get her hands dirty at the propeller maintenance shop at Robbins Air Force Base in Georgia. Whenever she can, Kegel returns to her first love. It sure does feel good to be part of big things. Aviation is one of the biggest things happening, and I like being a, a part of it in whatever role. Irene Leverton went on to establish the Women's Air Pylon Racing Association in 1965. 
She's 71, and in her 50 years of flying, she has tallied more than 24,000 hours in the air and continues to share her love of flight. I think, how could I sleep at night if I wasn't flying? I just, how do you disconnect? You know, hasn't everyone had something they wanted to do and just went and did it? After the astronaut tests, Janora Jessen went on to what she remembers as her dream job. She spent the summer of 1962 as one of the three musketeers flying cross-country on a promotional tour for beach aircraft. Today, at 61, Jessen still flies an occasional air race and recalls her small part in putting women into space. You do feel a connection. You feel like you had your finger just a little tiny bit in the pie. There have been a lot of changes, and uh, so maybe we made a, a tiny contribution. We enjoy a level of credibility, of respect and acceptance that we would not have but for those women. And they fought every inch of the road ahead of us to enable us to enjoy what we have now. To want to fly is something that human beings, male and female, have aspired to since the dawn of civilization. It is a human desire, not a male desire. Women were eager to go up in those airplanes. They weren't always encouraged, but there was the same sense of adventure, the sense of freedom, the sense of slipping the surly bonds of Earth. Those are not desires of men or women. Those are human desires. From Harriet Quimby's first flight in 1910, women pilots have worked hard to win equality in the skies, a quest that has inspired dreams, conquered fears, and stoked adventures, all ingredients necessary to go in search of history.